Tie, yeah, tie your hair up. <laughs> anyway, true story. Let's give you guys some definitions. <laughs> is that the scary? This is be much scarier than any ghost story in Honor Halloween and being in the dark. Okay, so here, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to draw you a picture here. Here's going to be your x-axis, and here is your y-axis, okay? And so I'm going to draw a picture here of a function that is increasing. And so what I want to do now here is this. I want you to think about the definition this way. You're going to walk left to what? Right. And so remember here, here's what's happening. As you're walking left to right, what do you guys notice? You're, you're going what? Uphill. Uphill. Do you guys agree with that? Okay, so... I'm going to give you the definition of what it means for a function to be increasing. Okay, so start off by doing this. This is the formal definition. It's in your book. They'll say here's your x1 and here's x2. Okay, so you got two x coordinates. And yes, every x coordinate has a corresponding what? Y coordinate value. So there's like y1 and then what? Y2, right? So as you're walking left to right, I want you guys to think of it this way. We say f is increasing for all values of x in the interval. They call i the interval. If f of x1 is less than f of x2. This is called your altitude, right? This is your y1 value is smaller than that y2 value here in your picture. Okay, so you're walking left to right, and so if the altitudes, this is going uphill. This is the uphill situation here, okay? You're going uphill. Does that seem um, okay? Okay, you guys okay with that? So we, this is the definition of a function that is really what? Increasing. It just means the altitude is getting bigger. Um, comparing that picture to the opposite of that. Okay. So the opposite of that picture looks like this. You say, okay, what is this going to be? Well, x1 and x2. And you're going left to right. Now, as you go left to right, what would you guys say? Is that uphill or is that downhill? So this is going to be downhill. So as you're going downhill, here's your definition now. We say F is decreasing for all values in, of X in the interval. Okay, if the reverse happens, you say, well, what's the reverse? Well, f of x1 is bigger than f of x2. Okay? Now, let me go back and start by saying this. x2 is smaller than x1. Okay, that just means it's to the left. So you, you're reading it left to right. Your first point here, and maybe it's, it's better to see it in colors. Um x1 is here and here 
x2. And that's the assumption here and here. And for every x value, you have a y value. So here's your y2 altitude. Here's y1. So you're really comparing these here. y1 is bigger than y2 as you move left to right. So I know these pictures are close together. Maybe we'll move them down. But how I see it is this in this way. If you're going uphill as you move left to right, x1 smaller than x2. And if it's an uphill situation, the, the function is increasing. The values are getting bigger. If the reverse happens, as you move left to right and you're going downhill, well, the function is decreasing. The values are getting smaller. And the values meaning the corresponding y values, right? Because y is f of x. So it's these altitude values, I guess. Those are your altitudes. And so that's what, we, that's what we mean by increasing and decreasing, just by definition. Now, what I'm going to do now here is this, to share with you guys something interesting. At these points, you have, this is like L1, tangent line. At those locations, you have L2, a second tangent line, and every tangent line has a slope. Is that right? So we actually have a test. These are the tests for increasing and decreasing. Okay, and you say, well, what's the test? Okay. Um, first test. If the derivative of the function is positive, because remember, that's m tangent. You guys remember that? So all of these tangent lines, by the way, have positive slopes. That's the point. Every one of those tangent lines, it's an uphill situation. They have positive slopes. So if the tangent line has positive slopes bigger than zero for the values of x in the interval, right, then the function is increasing. on or in that interval. So it comes back down to this derivative. You guys okay with that? The derivative is positive. It's a test for increasing, decreasing. So you're going to look for the derivative being positive over the interval, and that tells you the function's increasing. Now compare that to this situation at these points. Where, again, you have L1, that's, that's the tangent. Notice it has a negative slope. And at this point here, another tangent line called L2. Notice it has a what? Negative slope. Well, that's the deal. Here's your second test. Two. If the derivative is negative, for these values of x in the interval, then we are going to say f is actually what? Decreasing in the interval. It's a decreasing situation. Okay, so this is the test that we're going to be working with, okay? All right, 
so let's give you guys an example here, okay? And they're going to say something like this. Determine the intervals of increasing slash what? Decreasing. And I want to make sure I don't want to do some of the examples I already have because I want people to go back and take a look at those. So intervals of increasing, decreasing. Uh, okay. Well, here's some. Okay. f of x is x over x squared plus 4. I hope that's not even in your book. Okay, so when they say find the intervals of increasing, decreasing, this gives you guys a hint. You're going to have to get derivatives, and they, they're now inequalities, less than 0, greater than 0. So this is code for sign what analysis on that derivative. Right. Okay, so you go, okay, let's see what that is. Take the derivative of that function here. X over X squared plus 4. Notice, what do you guys have to use? Quotient rule, is that right? So we get X squared plus 4 squared. You have X squared plus 4. Take the derivative of X subtract x, and then you get the derivative of that x squared plus 4 here. Okay, so we know this derivative is 1. We get 2x. Okay, so we're going to get x squared plus 4 minus what? 2x squared, and then that'll be over x squared plus 4 squared, okay? So simplify this, and you're going to get 4 minus what? x squared over x squared plus 4 squared. So double check, ladies and gentlemen, to see if this is what? If this is correct. I think it is. Now, notice a few things here, just so you guys want to note here. Um, you're really going to have to find, if you're going to do sign analysis, and then you have a what? A rational. Um, I did put that video in online here, right? I did send that to you guys. The sign analysis procedure is key. So you're really trying to find critical values. Do you guys notice that? They're really trying to find critical values here. That's really the same thing. So you're going to find where the derivative is 0. Is that right? Horizontal tangent. That happens where 4 minus x squared equals 0 here. Okay, And then you're going to find where it's, if, since you're looking for those critical values, where is the denominator equal to 0? That means the derivative does not exist, right? So notice those two definitions. They're back really here, right? And then over here. 
So I'm going to do the easy one first, which is here. This never happens. Is that right? How do you guys know that never happens? Well, that means x squared plus 4 must be 0, and there's no real number, no real solution. It'll be complex. So you get complex solutions. So in other words, you throw this out because it never happens. The denominator is never zero. But the numerator is zero. You say, when is that? Well, use the square root formula. x squared is 4, and that means x will be what? Plus or minus square root of 4. x will be plus or minus 2. These are, by the way, critical values. Is that right? But you said, we're really doing sign analysis on the first derivative. And I'll say, well, yeah, that's partly s solving this. these equations are, are what you did before with critical values. So we did some of those critical values there. And then notice the domain of this function is all real numbers because the denominator, there's no vertical asymptotes. You say, why are there no vertical asymptotes? Because that denominator could never be zero. Right? So this is over all real numbers. Good. So what you do with sign analysis is if you guys remember the procedure, you got negative 2, you got positive 2. This is on the first derivative. I always label this with zeros. So your sign analysis procedure has region 1, region 2, region 3. These are those x values where you had the derivative at these numbers going to be 0 here, OK? So you guys remember with sign analysis, what do you guys do? You need to test each region. Yeah. So you need, a, you need to test the sign of that first derivative in region 1. So you need test points. I'll use negative 4. 0 is available for region 2, so I'm going to use that. I'll use positive 4. I'll be symmetric. So you're really testing what? These are all test points. OK. You say, what am I testing? You're testing the first derivative. You're trying to find where this thing equal is positive and negative. So I'm going to bring that down. So you're going to have to get that first derivative. OK. So let's plug in negative 4 as a test point, okay, for x. So what do you guys get for the, for the derivative? Isn't that going to be 4 minus negative 4 squared over negative 4 squared plus 4 squared? Is that true? And I think it looks like I get what? 4 minus... 16 over 16 plus 4 squared, which is negative 12 over 20 squared. What do I know about this? Isn't this what? This is really what? I only care. I don't care about the number. I care about the what? The sign. So at negative 4, that first derivative is what? It's negative. That means the slope of the tangent line is a downhill slope. I draw that picture. So region 1 is negative. OK, now what do we do with region 2? We're going to test that one. So you're going to plug in now 0. And you guys know what you get? 4 minus 0 squared over. Looks like it'll be 0 squared. Is that right? Plus 4 squared. What do I really care about? It's positive. So region 2 is positive. I draw that tangent line with a positive slope, an uphill slope. OK, that's kind of a good thing to do. Now, test region th uh, 3 with the test point of 4. So if you plug in 4 here, for x, 
you pretty much get what you got earlier. Only, yeah, you get the same kind of thing, right? The point being, region three is really what again? It's negative. So what I'll do is I'll draw the downhill slope, and this is all the information we need to answer the question, ladies and gentlemen. A picture's worth a thousand words, so here's your conclusion here. You might say, what do we get out of this? You know what we got? F is decreasing. With what regions? Yeah. Region 1 and Region 3. You say, how do we know? The negative what? The negative sign. So you're going to have to define those regions. Those regions are it's decreasing on from negative infinity up to negative 2, union 2 up to infinity. So we're trying to describe those regions here. This is this region and region 1, region 3. Oops, because you have a what again? Negative slope. What's going on in the middle here? And then what region is that? That's region 2. It's positive, right? So here's what you say. You say F is increasing on that region 2, which will be from negative 2 to 2. And that's really what they just asked you. Okay, that's your first example of it. And so that's why it really comes down to doing sign analysis on the what? First derivative, sign analysis. Get the derivative, perform sign analysis, and then you're done. Now, you might say, what about graphing? What does that mean on our curve? Well, this is x over x squared plus 4. So if I go to Desmos, y equals x divided by x squared plus 4, and then the, I have to, let's say negative 2 to, I don't know, 12. You see, you see what's going on here if I try to touch those points? If you guys can see this, if I can bring it in, you guys can see that this has everything to do with graphing. Ah. Wanted to add it to this one. So I'm going to demonstrate your answer. So you can see what we're talking about, right, in terms of graphing. So we say it's decreasing on what interval? So you're going downhill. Remember I said you're walking? You're walking downhill on this interval here. And then when you get to over here, what happens when you get at negative 2, right? Now you're going how? Aren't you going uphill now? Up until about positive 2. And then starting over here at, you know, to really to the right of positive 2, you're, bit, you're now going downhill again. Is that right? So you guys can actually see the picture on the graph as well. 
It's a downhill situation there. And it's uphill here. <coughs> I also want to point out, so you guys can see, this is a very special location as well. Where are you guys standing at at negative 2? This is called a relative what? Min. Isn't that a valley? You're in a valley at negative 2? And then where are you at here? That's a relative max. We'll give you guys that idea tomorrow. But this is all part of our graphing skills, um, and you can relate the answer here to the what? To the graph. Okay, so if you just know by the picture, you have a relative min and a relative max, top of a hill or in a valley. It actually satisfies those definitions of being a relative min and a relative max. So it's your first example on a scary Halloween day. What's the point? To review what? Sign analysis because you're doing it on the first what? Derivative now. And I'm actually looking back at my notes to share with you guys. You say, I want to see more scary examples because we'll do more tomorrow. But I don't want to do these. I'll try not to do these. I have these examples, t already eight examples there for you. If you want to see more. You say, I want to see more now. I can't wait till tomorrow. Well, instead of watching Halloween tonight on a scary Halloween evening giving out candy, Maybe you want to watch scary intervals increasing, decreasing, <laughs> and sign analysis. And then you also have that. It's out here in the video. Maybe calculating the logarithm. Okay. Yeah, all so, those things. See? All right. So have a great day, ladies and gentlemen. Take care and stay safe. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. I did have, and I'll remind you again, Extra examples here. Maybe we'll go over some of these examples. Uh, I have about eight of them. And also finding the relative max, relative min. But i got to formalize this um, as well. So there's a lot of different examples to go over. and um, or Not a lot. There's just kind of a few. And that's where we're at. So let me go back to what we did yesterday and give you guys a statement about the relative max, relative min here, okay? Because you said, oh, Mr. Judge, what are you talking about over here? You're in a, you're in a what? You're in a, a valley at negative two. And over here, you're on top of a hill at positive two. What in the world is that all about, right? And so your book, I'll give you guys the exact language of your book. Um. This is called the first derivative test for max and min. So we call this the first derivative test for the relative max and min. OK, and um, this is going to be exactly what we, you're really looking for, okay? So here's what your book says. I'll number it A, uh, one, not A. So first of all, let's see B, A, critical value. for a continuous function f. Question one. So you have a critical value for a continuous function. So question one is going to say this. If the derivative of the function changes from positive to negative 
at the critical value, critical number, at C. Then F has a local max. at C. Okay. If the derivative changes from negative to positive at C, then F has a local min at C. Okay, C is a critical number. And this is for a local maximum value that's not the local max but it's a, that's the location the local min so the third criteria is going to be this three if f prime does not change the sign at c the critical value then F has no local max or local min at C. Okay. So this is going to be what we use to determine local max and local min here. And, and for me, in all honesty, it's very easy to do. Let me show you why I think it's very easy. This is going to be based completely on sign analysis on the first derivative. That's what this is based on. And you might say, okay, well, let's go back and really think about this, right? Remember the sign analysis we did yesterday? Here's a picture, right? The reason I like to draw these lines here, right? And I really emphasize this here. Get rid of that. Get rid of some of this because it kind of gets in the way. The reason I draw this tangent line because that's what the first derivative is that's really the slope of the tangent line being negative okay is because it kind of describes the curve and so this is going from a negative slope to a what positive slope now i always put that person right here to say to you hey Aren't you in a valley there? Isn't that a picture of somebody in a valley? Yeah, so that's a local what? That's a local min. So that's my point to you. At negative 2, you have a local what min. At x is negative 2. This is what I want to emphasize. At x is negative 2, you got a local min. And then I change from a positive slope to a what? negative slope and then at this location we have a local what a local max and you say how do i know that because you're standing where at the top of a hill the highest value okay And so this tells you the location. 
So you guys can see it easily with these pictures. Can you see it very easily? All right, so that's why I draw these slopes of those lines. Now, what I do have to say, though, it doesn't tell you what the local max or local min is. It just tells you where it's at, and that's, that's important. Now, um, let me write this down here, okay? So I'm going to erase this because it's in our notes. But I'm now going to describe to you how to get the local max and local min, okay? So the local, we'll start with the local min. In this case, the local min is the altitude of the function at negative 2. This is why finding that negative 2 value was important. So whatever that is, that will be the local min. The local maximum value is f of 2. So you have to go back to the original function to find both local max and local min. This tells you the x values. These are all x values for which you find local max and local wet min. Okay, these are my x values. You guys okay with that? So what is f anyway? Oh, x over x squared plus 4? Okay, so since the function is x over x squared plus 4, plug in what? For the local min, you're going to plug in negative what? Negative 2. Do you guys know what you end up getting? This is negative 2 over what? Negative 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8. Is that negative one fourth? We're running out of space. So the local uh, minimum value is one fourth. And isn't that what you guys see over here? That's the y value. Negative 0.25 is negative one fourth. So this is the y value, and that's what we're really finding. The altitude is y. The x is the, the location, but that altitude here, that's negative 0.25. That's negative one fourth that you found. I'll put that as a fraction instead. So negative one what fourth over here. Okay? It's the altitude. Now, the local max. It's found the same way. It's just that you got to go back to the original function and plug that in. You get x over x squared plus 4. Plug in negative 2 or positive 2 now, sorry. And that will give you 2 over 8, which will be positive 1 fourth. So now, positive 1 fourth is 0.25. And there it is. That's the altitude. This is why you see 0.25 there. I'll get rid of that guy. All right, you got the cage? You can see it. It's the location. That's the relative maximum value and the relative minimum value, the highest altitude and the lowest altitude. X is the location. I mean, it depends on what you mean by location. You could say location is the X and Y coordinates. But if they ask you what is a, the local max and local min, these are the answers. Okay, and they will ask you those questions. So local min and local max are equal to y? Altitude is the y coordinate. Oh, okay. It's, it's just the y coordinate value. Remember, the, remember your curves, that's a hill in valleys, right? The altitude, the largest altitude is the max, and the you know, smallest altitude is the min. You could go below sea level, meaning you have a negative what? Altitude. And that's it. That's the local max, local min. It's the y values. And, you know, part of this is, is tools in, in curve sketching, so you guys know. So, I mean, this is the real meaning about this picture, and that's what you always want to know about. What does that picture mean? And now they just change all the curves on you, and you kind of see what this picture means. 
they ask you the same questions over and over again. And then I have, oh my God, I have eight, what, examples, I guess? I got to find another example to do. But I also don't want to do your homework. You guys know what I mean? Because then what's left for you to do? So I was thinking of, when I was taking a shower this morning, I was thinking of uh, bringing down another calculus book. Just doing some examples from that book. I should. No. No, I don't want to do your homework. I've, I got enough to do, like learn how to get on Twitter. <laughs> and I hate it. I'm not going to get on Twitter. I'm not, I'm not going to deal with this stuff. I'm just, I ain't going to deal with it. Sorry. Yeah, I could tweet your homework. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think in back of the book. Yeah, I'm looking at some questions here. It's just an analysis on a derivative. Uh, I think I give you guys odds, right? So I got an even. I don't know, but but I think the even questions were all on that worksheet I shared with you guys. Eight examples. So maybe I'll do some, or maybe I can go to the end of the chapter. Sometimes they have some there. Chapter review. I hope. Do they have any? It doesn't look like they have any. All right, let's try some here. Um, okay, I'm going to try this. Oh, this kind of looks interesting. X square root 2 plus X. Okay, and sometimes they give you a function like what? Like this. Hopefully I didn't mess it up. Okay. So we're going to find the intervals of increasing, decreasing, local max, local min. Okay, so... Let me write down what they want you to do. Determine intervals of increasing slash decreasing and local max, local min. So typically they have all of that stuff there, okay? So in my mind, I remember my daughter asked me, hey, Dad, what about these questions? How do you do this? I said, you know what? Sign analysis on the first derivative. Pass the salt. So I told her, do your sign analysis on the first derivative. So that's all I'll tell you guys. Side analysis on what? On y prime. Okay, let's try that out. Okay, what rule do you guys have to use? Product rule, is that right? Okay. What's this derivative? Uh, one half, two plus x to the minus one half times the derivative of two plus x, which is one by chain rule. Don't forget chain rule. And the derivative of x is one. So, ladies and gentlemen, that derivative will be One over two, two plus x, square root two plus x. Is that right? 
So double check, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's not one, it's X. I found my mistake. Okay. Isn't this the derivative? Yeah. Now, you really can't do sign analysis with this, so you're going to have to simplify. And you say, okay, how do I simplify? Well, you're going to have to add, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I would say take this. You need 2, 2, square root of what? 2 plus x. Is that right? Doing a little bit of that algebra. x over 2, square root of 2 plus x, plus 2, 2 plus x over that 2, square root of 2 plus x. So your y prime will be now x plus 4 plus 2x over 2 square root 2 plus x. And so that derivative, when you add, it looks like it's going to be double check. Was that plus? I think so. Three x plus four over two square root of what? Two plus x. So double check to see if I'm uh, okay. Haven't had that second cup of coffee yet. Woke up at four a.m. and I haven't had that second cup. So double check. Are you guys good with this one? Do we get the right? You okay. Okay, double checking everything. Okay, looks okay to me. All right, now here's the deal. We we're supposed to do what here with this? However, let's be careful here. Here's what we want to do. Um, you, so in analysis, you have a quotient, so we want to know where the numerator is zero. Is that right? So you're going to set that numerator equal to zero here. So we get 3x plus 4 equals zero. What does that mean? 3x is negative 4, or x will be negative what? 4 thirds. Is that true? You also want to know where that denominator is what? Zero. So you say 2 square root. 2 plus x is 0. That means square root 2 plus x is 0. That means uh, 2 plus x has to be 0 or x is negative 2. Now these are potential what? These are potential critical values. Is that right? Why did I say they are potential critical values and not critical values? I don't even know yet if they're critical values. How do I know for certain? You got to go back up here and what? What's the domain? Remember the definition is that those values have to be in the domain. In other words, is this function defined at negative four-thirds and at negative two. How do we know, ladies and gentlemen? Well, what's the real concern here? Under the radical, you, you can't have the square root of a negative. So what you do to get the domain, you're not concerned about this value over here, okay? That doesn't matter. It's whatever's under the radical that matters. So you're going to say, oh, for my domain, 2 plus x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Or x needs to be greater than or equal to negative 2. OK? So the question is, which one of these numbers is greater than or equal to negative 2? I think they both are. Is that true? So you have some what? These are critical values. Okay, good. So both of them work. Yeah. They're actually values on the curve, actually. 
this curve is only defined for what? Values of x that are greater than or equal to negative 2. You say, what is this curve? x square root of 2 plus x. I'm going to go to Desmos to share this with you guys. So here's my point to you. Okay. That's really the curve, by the way. All right, you guys okay with that? And I can already see something interesting happening. What were the two critical values I got? I got a negative 2. Is that right? Is the function defined at negative 2? Okay, we'll see what this means. All right, let's do our sign analysis now, okay? So sign analysis, ladies and gentlemen. We got to be we got to be careful with this. Negative two and negative four thirds. You guys okay with that? This is sign analysis on the first derivative. At negative two, what do I know about the first derivative? What does this information mean here? What's going on at negative two? The function's not what differentiable this is the this is the derivative of y okay you're not differentiable at negative two you're defined at negative two but it's not differentiable why because y prime you guys see remember this here all right but the derivative at negative four thirds is actually what zero so what i want to remark here this is why this is a really good question here We really have one, region one and region two. Do you guys notice? How come I don't start over here to the left of negative two? How come I'm not going to consider any values to the left of negative two? Do you guys know why? Your function is only good for values that are greater than or equal to negative two. They're not, it's not even defined for values smaller than there. Because of the domain of the function. Go back to the, the domain. What's under the radical has to be greater than or equal to 2. So that's what we did the work here. Oh, so, domain. so your domain, really, formally, we say the domain here is going to be set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 2. Solve that simple inequality for x. That's why we know their critical values because they have to be defined for the original function. they got to be points on the curve that's the definition of critical values they got to be points on the curve where the derivative does not exist or the derivative is zero so negative two is on the curve negative four third is on the curve but negative two val values to the left of negative two are not on your curve so you have to throw those out so don't start to do sign analysis for, for don't say this is region one it won't work you have an issue Okay, you guys okay with that? That's an important detail. Students, when they actually do these questions, that's where they make a mistake. They assume, that's the first place. They assume you actually have a region to the left of negative two. For this example, you don't. Okay, now, sign analysis, what's the deal? We gotta test region one with a test point. We gotta test region two with a test point. I'm gonna go straight to region two and I'm gonna use zero as a test point, why? It's the easiest number to work with. But then now I need a test point that's between negative 2 and negative 4 thirds. What should I use? I don't know, negative, maybe negative what? Negative 3 halves? Negative 3 halves okay? Negative 1.5? Okay. Okay. These are my two test points. What am I testing again? I'm testing the first derivative. So you have to go back. I'm testing this thing. So you have to write this function down or bring it over. I just want to see the sign of that. 
So if I plug in negative 1.5, negative 1.5 for x, I'm going to test for the sine. This is the test point. Do you guys know what happens here? What's the sign? What's 3 times negative 1.5? Is that negative 4.5? And then plus 4? I don't really care. I just know that my numerator is negative. Is that right? And then 2 plus a negative 1.5 is positive. So my denominator really is going to be positive. What's a negative divided by a positive? Negative. Region 1 is negative, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, region one's negative. Now, we're going to have to now test what? Use zero as a test point. So three times zero is zero. Uh, zero plus four is what? Positive. And then two plus zero is two. Uh, denominator is positive. So what's a positive divided by a positive? One. I only care about the sign, not the value. So ladies and gentlemen, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is the deal, okay? Everything we need to know to answer the question we're looking at. Just make sure you draw the negative what? Negative sloped tangent line, positive sloped tangent line. And make sure you're standing where? In the valley. What does that mean? You have a relative what? Minimum value. Sign analysis on the first derivative gives you everything you need to know here. And that's the deal. That's it. Using these test points. Okay. Let's let's come now let's let's read this here. This is gonna be important. Um, you can say the function f or y, call it what you like, maybe f, because y equals what? f of x. You guys remember that? Always. Y is f of x. So we can say f is decreasing on what interval? This is important. Where interval is, is negative for the derivative. Everything between negative 2 and what? And positive, uh, negative 4 thirds. Is that true? So let's be careful here. Why do I use open endpoints? This is an important thing as well. Why is that open? What does that even mean? That means you don't include the values. Okay? At negative 2, the derivative does not exist. At 0, the derivative is 0. I'm sorry, negative 4 thirds. The derivative is 0. Those are not negative values, okay? A negative derivative value is where it's decreasing. It's negative. Zero is not negative, it's neutral. Does not exist is, is not negative. Okay, is that, is that okay with you guys? You guys okay with that? Okay, and then what do you guys say? F is what? Increasing. Where is F increasing on? Same thing. Negative four-thirds to what? To infinity, is that right? So, ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. That's how you answer this uh, negative four-thirds to infinity here. Okay? Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a question here. You only have a relative min. You do not have a relative max. Why? Relative min, ladies and gentlemen. Say, what's the relative min? It's f of negative what? Four thirds. And there's no relative max. How do we know? You guys want to tell me how you know? How do you guys know? Because there's no heel. It's only a valley in this curve. There's no heel, only a valley. So if I want the relative min value, i got to go back to the original function. 
and there it is. I got to plug in what there? Negative four thirds for x. So you say, okay, what do I plug in? Negative four thirds. Which means you get negative four thirds square root of uh, two minus four thirds, right? Which, by the way, will be what? Three, three, six. So this will be negative four thirds square root of six. Uh, square. This is two thirds. Okay. Negative four thirds square root of two, square root of three. Rationalize that denominator. Negative four square root of six over nine. So negative four square root of six, nine. That's this answer here. And this is essentially all the information they're going to want to know. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And let's go back to decimals. That's why you see this picture. This is the picture exactly of what's going on here. Okay, so I'm going to do this here. Bring that into relative max, relative min. Or intervals of increasing, decreasing. So again, let's walk on the curve, okay? You're walking on this curve and you are going downhill, is that right? So you say you're walking on this curve, you're going downhill. That's the lowest altitude, negative four thirds here. And then you're going uphill forever, is that right? So for these values of x, if I can highlight that, you're going downhill. Uh, negative four, where is that? Negative, uh, sorry, it's not negative four thirds. Apologize, negative, negative four thirds might be here. That's negative 1.089. So what I'm saying is you are going downhill on this interval. If I can get the highlighter. Okay, you're going downhill in that interval, and then you're going uphill forever after that. Those are the intervals, and that's the whole idea. So in gray, downhill, and then in brown, you're going what? Uphill forever. But they're giving you the values of x for that. And notice you got that horizontal tangent here. So that's how it relates to the other geometry you've been looking at, where that slope is zero. So ladies and gentlemen, this is kind of, again, this is your relative, uh, relative minimum value as well, okay? You're standing in a valley here. And there is no relative max, meaning there is no hill. So it goes back really the sign analysis picture tells you everything. Picture's worth a thousand words. Somebody had a question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm still a bit unsure about like, uh, the dynamic uh, distribution. Well, 
very simply, whenever you have square root functions, you set whatever is under the radical equal to zero and you solve for x. And that solution, whatever that solution is, is your domain. So that's why you went under the radical for the function and said 2 plus the square root of x has to be positive or 0. That's exactly what we did in orange there. So the only values that work for this function are values of x that are at least 2. And again, see the graph? See the graph? This is where that, sorry, negative 2. This is where that negative 2 is. So this curve is only defined for values of x that are what? It would be imaginary. Yeah. This is only calculus of real variables. Yeah. Thank you. It's just that simple. This curve is only defined for values of x. There are at least two. And that's the, and that's the thing, because I think that's where, where when I grade uh, calculus exams on that question, that's where people make a mistake. They forget, oh, what's the domain of the function? And they might try to do a negative, and they, they just give answers that are kind of wildly inaccurate, you know. Um, anyway, that's kind of a nice question. What do you guys think? Should I give you another nice question? Because I'm just taking them out of this book. Ooh, what about this one? Aren't those different than the questions I gave you the other eight examples for? They're different, so I would watch all of them. That's the beauty of recording. I could give you 500 examples now. But that's how some students complain. They go, Mr. Judge, I don't have time to watch all this stuff. I say, okay, it's all right. <laughs> Can't solve every problem. You guys know what I'm saying? That's why maybe you want to look at that survey and complete the survey. <laughs> okay, let's find intervals of increase and decreasing. I just want to curious about this, see if you guys remember. What's the domain? Since we're talking about domain. Look, it's all real numbers, but you got to throw out zero. We got to throw out what? Negative one. So domain, that's exactly what we say. Set of all x such that x can't be these values. So you might say, why did you start off with that this time? Well, because the topic was earlier, hey, how do you get that domain? So remember, you said those values equal to zero. Those are the numbers you have to throw out. They're not in the domain. And I can even show you in Desmos, which is amazing, you're going to have vertical asymptotes there. Is that true? Do you guys know what I'm saying? Vertical asymptotes. To go, Mr. Judge. Oh, my God. That's, a, that's an interesting question. You have vertical asymptotes at 0 and negative 1. Is that true? So I'm just kind of, when I see this, that's what pops into my head. Yeah. Just kind of share that with you guys. See this here? You know, well, how does that even look? What, uh, what's going on here? Well, let's see what's going on with the calculus, okay? Let's find intervals of increasing, decreasing. So that's why we're here. We're going to differentiate this y. 1 over x plus 1 over x plus 1. Is that true? And how would you guys do this, by the way? 
Well, maybe you could use quotient rule, but I'm going to use this power rule. I don't always recommend you do that, but negative 1 times x to the minus 2 plus negative 1 times x plus 1 to the minus 2 times 1 by chain rule, which is negative 1 over what? x squared, uh, not plus but minus 1 over x plus 1 in parentheses squared. Is that right? But somehow you're going to have to use what? Sign analysis on this. What do you think that means? Right? How do we use sign analysis here? I just took out these questions from the review section. How do I use sign analysis? Okay, I'm going to have to subtract here, I guess, right? Well, just make sure I did my derivative correct because I haven't had my second cup of coffee. Um, it looks like I have a, uh, a, a rationals. Is that true? So I'm going to say this is negative 1 times what? x plus 1 squared minus 1 times x squared, everything over x squared times x plus 1 squared. So that derivative becomes, I'll take out the negative sign. I'll factor out the negative sign. And this will be x squared, x plus 1 squared. OK? So this here is my sort of simplified version. But I still can't what? I can simplify further. Is that right? You say, well, how can we simplify further? Uh, y prime will be, I put the negative sign here. This is x squared plus, um, is that 2x plus 1 plus another x squared over x squared x plus 1 squared. So my y prime becomes negative, negative what? 2x squared plus 2x plus 1 over x squared times x plus 1 squared. Another rational function. And that's at the, and this negative sign is down here. Okay? So I'm just kind of curious, sign analysis on the what? When is a derivative zero? When the numerator is what? So my numerator has to be zero. Is that true? So I'm going to have to solve that equation. 2x squared plus 2x plus 1 equals 0. And then the denominator has to be 0. So that's x squared. x plus 1 squared is 0. OK? The denominator is 0 is where the derivative does not exist. The numerator is 0 is where the derivative equals 0. They both will give critical values. OK? Maybe. This means x is 0, and this means x plus 1 is 0, right? Or x is what? Negative 1. We don't know, or we actually do know. Our derivative does not exist for 0 at negative 1. So I'm going to put some notes here. This is an important detail. Right prime does not exist for x is 0 and x is not negative 1. Why, ladies and gentlemen, does it not exist? Do you guys know why? Don't you have vertical asymptotes at 0 and 1? Or 0 and negative 1? So what did you guys remember on that first test? Functions are not differentiable at vertical asymptotes. So sure enough, that makes some sense. At 0 and negative 1, 
we had vertical asymptotes. It's not differentiable. Functions are, don't, are not differentiable there. Okay. Are they critical values, though? Say what? These are not what? Critical values. Why could they not be critical values? They're not in the domain. Remember, functions have to be defined for it to be called a critical value, by the way. Anyway, we're still going to use it inside analysis, but I want to point that de detail out. Now, what about, what about this, 2x squared plus 2x plus 1? Right? What do we know here? Is it factorable? I don't think it's factorable. So it's not factorable, ladies and gentlemen. But don't fear. Uh, negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac, everything over 2a. Oh, okay. What's the deal? 4 minus 8. What do you guys notice? This y prime is never 0. Is that right? How do I know that? How do we know y prime is never 0? Y prime's not zero. Does anybody know why? What happens in here? Isn't that negative? Is that negative? So don't you get, isn't 4 B squared minus 4 AC? Oh, that's 4 minus 8. It's negative. So there's no x-intercepts. Or I should say there's no solution. No real what? Solution. If there's no real solution, y prime is not zero. So what does this really mean? This tells me you have no what? Critical what? Values. So they could even ask you, like on a test, hey, here's your function. What are the critical values? Be careful, there is no what? Critical values. You guys with me on that? So I'm even sharing with you guys other examples on how to find critical values using my definition. What's the definition? Where the derivative is zero, where the derivative does not exist, but they must be points in the domain. So guess what? There are no critical values for this function. Doesn't mean you can't use sign analysis, though. Okay, what does this mean for the sign analysis? Here's what this means. Let's go back. Right? Think of this as a rational function now, right? See this rational function? The problem is at 0 and negative 1. So at negative 1 and 0, okay, your derivative... What do you guys know? Does not exist. Does not exist. Is that right? What was the domain of the function? All real numbers but negative 1 or 0. Well, that makes sense. So I have values to the left of negative 1. In other words, this makes sense. You guys with me on that? Okay, where is now, give me a number to the, in region 1. Negative two. negative 2. Give me a number between 0 and negative 1. Okay. Negative 0.5, I guess. Then maybe positive 1. You guys okay with that? Yes. What am I supposed to test again? We're testing what? The first derivative.
Okay. I got to see where it's positive, where it's negative. Okay, now, uh, if I plug in negative 2 here, let's be careful here. Um, what do I end up get, uh, getting here? It looks like I'm going to have to do some arithmetic, okay? So y prime is negative 2 times negative 2 squared plus 2 times negative 2 plus 1. Remember, I only care about the sign, not the value. Negative 2 squared, negative 2 plus 1 what squared? Do you guys know what's going on in the denominator? I don't care about the answer. Isn't it always positive in the denominator? All right, the numerator now. Oh, yeah, the denominator is positive. Okay. The numerator, 2 times negative 2, isn't that 4? Minus 4, which is 0, plus 1. But my numerator, don't forget, you have this negative sign here, okay? So my numerator is going to be really negative. What's a negative over a positive? Negative. So this region is what? Negative. Region 1 is negative. Okay. I'm going to test region 3 because it's, e uh, it's easier to plug in a positive 1. So I'm going to test region 3 first. 1, 1, 1, 1. Do not forget this negative. So the denominator again will be positive. I don't care about the answer. 1 squared is positive. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 squared is positive. Okay. Don't forget, I'm going to keep that negative sign out here, okay? Just in case you guys forget. 2 times 1 squared, is that 2 plus 2 plus 1? Well, I don't care. That's Is that positive? So what's a positive over a positive? Isn't that positive? Then we get another negative. So it looks like, so far, negative slope what? Negative slope. Notice, you don't have a valley there. Okay, you don't have a critical value even. Alrighty, let's test. Oh, I apologize. That was that was not. That was region three. Remember that we did region three. We skipped region two because that one's negative point five. So let's plug in that value. Negative one half. So I'm going to keep in mind we factored out that negative, okay? We only care about the sign. Your denominator is positive again always because every time you square things, it makes it positive. And then 2 times uh, that negative 1 half squared will be 1 fourth, so that will be 1 half. Plus 2 times negative 1 half will be negative 1 plus 1. That's 0. So it's negative. So this will be positive. And then what's the deal? Double check to see if I'm okay with that. So this will be a negative as well. Is that true? So it looks like this function strictly what? <coughs> Decreasing. Is that true? Yes, you have vertical asymptotes. And that does make sense. Why does this make some sense? Let me get this picture in Desmond. Let's see why this makes sense. See if you guys understand what I'm saying here. I want to bring this up so you guys are clear. Isn't this region one? This is region two, and this is region what? Three. Are you going downhill in region one? Say yes. 
Are you going downhill in Region 2? Yes. It's a very steep downhill forever. Are you going downhill in Region 3 as well? What do you guys think? Downhill in all three regions? So let's, let's do our conclusion here, okay? Because our picture is worth a thousand words. I just pick this example from the what? From the book under the review sort of exercises. Finding critical values and intervals of uh, increasing, decreasing, relative max, relative min. So we're going to say F is what? Decreasing. Where is F decreasing on? You guys know where F is decreasing on? Uh, region 1. Region what? 2. Region 3. Would you guys agree with that? So what is region 1 now? Negative infinity up to negative 1. Open circle. Why are these open circles? You can't include negative 1 or 0. The derivative does not exist there. Union, negative 1 to 0, open intervals here. Open intervals. Union, 0 to what? Infinity. And then pretty much that's it. Why is, it, why is that just your answer? Why are we done? Well, is it increasing anywhere? No. So, I mean, they didn't ask, I mean, you don't have to answer, but I want you guys to notice that F is not what? Increasing anywhere. There is no relative what? Max, and there is no relative what? Min. Because the picture is worth a thousand words. You're not changing, increasing, decreasing from negative to positive or positive to negative at critical values. In fact, there is no what? Critical values. So that should make a lot. Of, this is why definitions are so important. Makes sense. So in order to be a critical value, it has to be a value, it has to be a point on the curve. It has to be on the curve. If it's not on the curve, will never be a critical value. Even if the derivative is zero there or the derivative does not exist, it doesn't matter. So ladies and gentlemen, um, you now get extra examples on critical values even. Sign analysis on the first derivative tells you everything you need to know. And then what happens later is you use these, this information to sketch the curve. You go, really? Yeah, that's kind of the idea behind some of this also, curve sketching. So, like I said, when I, I shared with you guys, do your sign analysis homework, or not sign analysis, do, do that review. I was kind of serious. What do you guys think? Was I serious about it? You say, yeah, because you did use sign analysis, but also what's important is the algebra. Is that right? So you're not just finding a derivative. You're considering even the domain, and you're even considering the what? The algebra when you after you find a derivative, because you can't, you can't even solve that equation. It, it reduced it to this equation unless you do algebra. And that's why I sent you guys some of the, the resources that I did. So, all right, we're out of time. Uh, question. question. No, um, okay, why did we why do we have negative one and zero? That's where for sign analysis, this is where your denominator equals what? Zero. Oh, okay. So whenever you have a rational function, you always have to consider in sign analysis where the numerator equals zero and where the denominator equals zero. So in a sense, you say here's a rational function for sign analysis. Numerator is zero is where the fraction is zero. Denominator is zero where the fraction is undefined. However, in the context of a derivative, derivatives are never undefined. Derivatives are what? 
are not differentiable because they're a limit. Remember that? So that's why I didn't say undefined here at negative 1 and 0. That's why I said it was what does not exist because this is sign analysis for the first derivative. So you have to change that language because it's a derivative. And that's how you do, really, sign analysis for a rational. In intermediate algebra and pre-calculus, they just simply say what? Undefined. Undefined in those classes. In a calculus class, because it represents a derivative, we say does not exist. So it's, you know, sign analysis, really. That's the process. I like the, the reason why we didn't use numerator is we don't know numerator. Well, the numerator didn't contribute. The, the, this fraction is never zero. You go, how do I know? Because when I try to solve the numerator equal to zero, that's when a fraction is always zero. If your numerator is zero, we get that polynomial that doesn't give us real solutions. It gives us complex solutions. So there's no contribution. There's no location on that curve where you have the derivative equal to zero. There's no location on the curve where you have a horizontal what? Tangent. There's no horizontal tangents anywhere. See how it all fits? That's what we've been working on. What do you guys think? I just pulled those questions out of the hat. And none of them were even trig equations. Anyway, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Stay safe. Have a wonderful post-Halloween day. <clears throat> Math 261. I was a busy boy yesterday. Worksheets and videos. I kind of added some additional videos here. Or not videos, uh, worksheets. So, I mean, you might want to consider some of those things. I'll, I'll kind of go into some more details here. But I added this here. Remember, I gave you guys extra examples on what? You said, take a look at these intervals of increasing, decreasing. You got all those nice extra examples. Is that true? So this is the questions and finding relative max, relative min. And then I said, hey, you got some extra here. You got the video portion of them, going over the videos of it, over those questions here. All right, now, um, so what I did is I did a follow-up. I called this what? Intervals of increasing, decreasing part what? Two. So I'm going to do some of these here. So I put another one. I think they're interesting. I got them from another book. Like I said, I just remember I mentioned you guys. I, I was looking at another book. So, you know, we got a couple of examples here. Let's try to let's try to do some of these. What do you guys think? Okay. Um, so I'm going to try this example here. And, of course, I put the curve there so you guys can see the details. Um, but we have y equals, what is this? Sine minus 2 what? Cosine with a restricted domain between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, so let's do a interval of increasing, decreasing, um, but now with a trig function. Okay, find relative max, relative min, all those things, right? So let's try this out. And what do you think? How do you get the derivative? Do you guys remember? This is going to be code for sine analysis on that first derivative. So I'm going to differentiate again what? Sine minus 2 cosine. So properties of derivatives, pull out the constant. And then what's your derivative of sine? Do you guys know? Cosine. What's your derivative of cosine? Negative sine. 
So what you should get as a derivative is cosine, now negative 2 times negative sine. Doesn't that give you what? Plus 2 sine. So here's the derivative. Here's our first derivative, okay? All right. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now, you might look at this and say, okay, how do I get those things called critical values? Because I need critical values. Do you guys remember? I just want to think about critical values or you might just go straight to the idea that we're saying what? Sign analysis on that first derivative. So maybe you want to think of that too, but it's always in the back of your mind that this function is actually continuous over all real numbers. Is that true? And what did they give you here? What is this known as, by the way? Do you guys know? That's called a what? It's an interval, but this is a restricted what? Domain. domain. So this is this is going to be a continuous function over your restricted domain. Now, you might say, well, why are you even talking about that? Because it's important to know if you're going to get critical values, it's important to know. And I even did, you know, I even listed these these worksheets here. I created, by the way, going back, critical values part two. You know, I gave the same sort of worksheet, the same questions, but I just asked in that setting, hey, what are the critical values? You guys know what I mean? So one day, you know, I'm going to make use of this stuff. And then you said, or oh, you're so busy, I got the idea and said, you know what's nice? Because you know, finding critical values talks about the concepts of differentiability. So with the same functions, what did I do? Same thing. I'm asking people here about, you know, where the functions differentiable. You know, not at vertical asymptotes, of course. Not at corners, of course. Everywhere. Everywhere, nice and smooth. You guys know what I mean? Nice and smooth. Oh, vertical, a vertical tangent. Um, oh, we got a corner again. Not differentiable. Nice and smooth. Okay. Oh, nice and smooth. And then vertical asymptotes. Okay. Uh, and then, oh, this nice random kind of piecewise situation. So I even did that too yesterday. And then you said, boy... All of that where you're, where you're at a meeting, multitasking? Yes. And then I created, uh, I used the same functions to do continuity. Talk about answers about continuous functions. Where are your functions continuous and blah, blah, blah. Because this is the reality of it. This is what you guys care about, right? So I even did use the same exact functions yesterday as we're working with. This is all ideas and calculus. I even went further. You're going to see... Uh, not critical values, well, we are, but I even went further and put, what? Intervals of concavity with the same functions. So, so these are additional examples that I'll do one day, I guess, or go over, or some, make some use of it. Okay, intervals of concavity and inflection points, same curves that we're working with now, because this is what this is about, you know? So anyway, I just want to share that with you guys, and I even put them in your, in your what? Calculus handout module. All these things. So I updated those too in case people care. Who knows? But anyway, back to the question at hand, okay? Because what you want to now do is set this derivative equal to what? Zero. To zero. Solve for x. And if you do that, you're saying cosine plus what? Two sine equals zero. So this is a trig equation. You got to solve that for x. And so if you guys don't know, um, you get sine 2 sine x is minus cosine x. And then we can say, 
Well, what do we do here? Sine x. Yeah, how do we solve that? Do you guys know how we solve this? Well, I'll say, isn't it sine? Isn't that minus one half cosine x? And then divide both sides by cosine, and what do we get? Sine over cosine is going to be what? Is that negative one half? Let me see. Do we double check here? Cosine plus two sine x. And does that mean tangent is one half? Is that right? You guys okay with that? All right, I'm just going to solve this. I just took this out of another calculus book. So what would I do here? Do you guys know what I would do? I'd say, okay, where's tangent negative? I'm going to go to my pictures. This is what's done in a trig course, if I can find what I'm looking for. I'll use this one. Do you guys remember this? All students take what? Calculus. Calculus. Where's tangent negative? <laughs> Tangent's negative where? Looks like quadrant, what, all students, quadrant two. And quadrant what? Four. All right, quadrant two, quadrant four. Let me um, get what I need. What do I need? I'm using the maybe blue. Come on, draw an arrow. Okay, quadrant two, quadrant four. What's the problem, though? What am I going to have to do? Find the reference angle. The reference angle, if this was a trig course, is quadrant what? Quadrant one. You guys okay with that? All right, now you might say, okay, Mr. Judge, looks like I'm going to have to solve a, get a quadrant one solution. Here's my angle here. I have to remember the definition of tangent. It's going to be what? Opposite over what? Over adjacent. Is that true? And then what do you guys know about this? You go, ah, oh, Mr. Judge, what's the problem with this? Is this a special triangle? This is not a special triangle. We'll say not special. So what do you guys do if you don't have a special triangle? Oh man, what would you do? I just took this from another calculus book. Oh, man. Oh, that's horrible. What do you guys do? Get out your what? I'm just, get out your calculator. What's inverse tangent now? You're going to have to wake up the TI, okay? You guys remember this? This isn't a trig class. You guys ever take a good trig course? Should algebra and trig be a prerequisite for calculus? Maybe you guys want to do that extra credit assignment, that survey. <laughs> should algebra and trig be extra credit? Uh, not extra credit. Should they, be, should they be prerequisite for the course? <laughs> huh? 
it's pretty much what that stuff is about prerequisites anyway i think they should be i don't know i'm a silly guy though all right second no not second yeah second tangent right uh one divided by two and i think this is in degree mode by the way okay so let me do this this i'm going to go out to the nearest whole degree okay so i apologize so let's go back with with dealing with trig what that really means is that this is a 26 degree what angle okay this is called the reference angle is that right And so you might say to me, all right, Mr. Judge, but, you know, that's the positive. You just got through telling us that what? That the angle is in quadrant two, quadrant three. So I just want to make it a little bit more, somewhat more realistic in terms of the picture if I can. All right. Because that's important. This is how you use that 26 degrees. You guys okay with that? However, that's not the solution. You need a quadrant two. And how do you get quadrant two, right? I'll put quadrant two. The solution is x is 180 degrees minus the reference angle. Is that true? Do you guys know what I'm saying? And that'll be 154 degrees, okay? I'm gonna approximate to the nearest whole degree. Now, what about the quadrant three solution? Okay, because this is now what we're saying. This X is approximately 154 degrees. How do I get the other solution? Do you guys remember? Quadrant three solution. Oh, not quadrant three, sorry. Quadrant what? Four. How do you get the quadrant four solution? There's a couple of ways we could do it. Quadrant four, X will be 360 degrees minus that 26. Is that right? Minus the reference. And what does that give you? I think it's 334 degrees. So this is how we solve this, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's in degrees, though. OK? So, I mean, we can convert it to radians, and I think if I had a nice uh, special triangle, I would. But this is zero to what again? 360. We'll, we'll convert maybe at the end there, but I'm going to keep it as is. This is zero to 360. Is that true? So we're supposed to do sine analysis, though. And you might say to me, how do, how do I do sine analysis? We'll keep it in degrees. What do we just find, ladies and gentlemen, the solutions here for negative tangent? Those are the values. Those are the solutions. 26 to, uh, 154 degrees. And what? 334 degrees. This is that first derivative. Here's where it's zero. Um, let's be careful, though. This is a restricted domain that starts at zero. And where does it end? Our restricted domain, ladies and gentlemen, ends at 360, 2 pi, 0 to 2 pi. Is that right? So I'm going to do this here. This is how we go about this. Region 1, region 2, and region what? 3. All right. You guys okay with that? This is sign analysis on that first derivative. It's in degrees. That's okay. Now, I'm going to use 90 degrees as a test point because it's available for region one. And I guess I'll use 180 degrees 
for region two, and then I might use, I don't know, 350 degrees. No, let's use 350 degrees, okay, for region three. Okay, you guys okay with that? These are all my what? Test points. Aren't those clearly in the regions? Okay, what's the derivative again? So this is what I would do. So you guys might be happy because they actually gave us what? A non-special triangle solution, but this is how you do that. So when I teach my tricks, uh, uh, solving equations, I do do this as well. So let's go and let's test region one. How do we test region one? Do you guys know? Plug in 90 degrees. Oh, maybe, maybe I don't have to. What's cosine 90? Isn't that zero? What's sine 90? Is that one? What do you guys know about that answer? Region one is what? Isn't it positive? That means you have an increasing situation for region one. Okay, I don't even have to use my calculator. Plug in cosine 180, sine 180 now. Let's see what we get testing region two now. You guys okay with that? Uh, region two, ladies and gentlemen, y prime will now be, uh, what's cosine 180? Isn't that negative one? And then two times, what's sine of 180? Isn't that zero? So we get negative one, ladies and gentlemen, here. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, now we can say, what about 350? Okay, let's, use, let's do the 350 now. I'm going to have to use my calculator here. So that's really unavoidable. And technically, we're kind of doing things wrong. I'll explain in a, in a minute, but it's okay. So I have to have cosine 350 plus 2 sine 350 degrees. Let's see what this is. Get out the TI. I'm in, uh, I know I'm in degree mode. Cosine 350. Double check your calculator. You have to be in the right mode. Plus 2 sine now 350. Okay, what do you guys end up with? I don't really care what I end up with, but I care about the sign. So it's positive. Okay. And so this is now decreasing region two, increasing region one. I got news for you guys. We really can't do anything that we're really doing unless we're in radians. So let's convert. So now what we can do is this. Let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this degrees. We don't really need it. Okay. Here's my point. What is 154 degrees as radian measure? 334 degrees as radian measure. We need those two values in radian measure. Do you guys know how to convert to radians? Anybody take that trig course? Fill out the survey. <laughs> huh? Yeah, you just multiply by the factor. Remember this? Let's do it right here. Uh, 154 degrees times pi over what? 180. 334 degrees. Pi over 180. One fifty four pi second. There's pi divided by one eighty. Okay, and I'm gonna go out to the nearest thousands two point six eight eight. Now let's get the other one. Okay. 
2.688, and then let's get the other radian measure. So, okay, so now we'll do 334 times pi divided by 180. Double check to see if I'm doing it okay, because I can't see, and I haven't had my second cup of coffee. 829, is that right, to the nearest thousandths? And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go back here. How about this? Let's move it all down. Uh, what was that? Five eight what? Five eight two nine. Sorry. Okay. So I'm just gonna put this information here. Leave that in your notes just in case, and even in the video. So, you know, really, when you when you, the reason I say we're doing things wrong in some ways, it's not. It's okay. It's not an issue. Um, because whenever you take a derivative of a trig function, it's really assumed to be in a radian measure. And that's why they always give you radian measure in a calculus course like this. So to 2 pi. It's in radian measure always. They don't give you degrees. So your derivatives are really defined only for real values, which is a radian measure, a real number. So you're looking back at the book here for this question. Um, I mean, I know what you can see. You can see it symbolically. I wrote it numerically. But let's actually, let's actually kind of answer some questions here, okay? Because a picture is worth a what? Thousand words. You're looking at a lot of interesting information here. Okay? This interval right in here, 0 to that value, let's color, I don't know what colors to use, maybe orange. Increasing, and then what here? Increasing, is that right? Zero to two pi. Green, we're going to say what? Decreasing. So here's your, your conclusion. Your function f is increasing on what interval? From zero to 2.688. Put a parenthesis. Union. 5.829 to 2 pi, and put that bracket there. So this is the orange. Okay. And then, where are you decreasing? Region 2? So F is going to be what? Decreasing on region 2, which is between 2.688 and 5.829. And then these are parentheses. Why, why are these parentheses? Do you guys know? Yeah, what's happening supposedly at these values? At these values, the derivative is equal to what? Zero. Is that true? Your derivative is zero at those values. Zero is not positive, it's not negative. No, zero is not positive, it's not negative. No, it is differentiable. That derivative is zero, we just showed it. And that's kind of why, if you said to me, is that why you did the worksheet on differentiability as well? Yeah. Yeah, because then it's important to know what that even means. Because these are critical values, ladies and gentlemen. These are, which you just found, are really critical values. These values of x are critical values. They're, they're in the domain of the function, okay? 
because the function's continuous. That's why I use the same function. You guys, now you understand why I did that worksheet. I'm thinking in the future, hey, give them the same set with all these ideas. Hey, where is it continuous? Where is it differentiable? Same functions. Um, critical values. What else? Intervals of increasing, decreasing. That's what we're seeing. And then concavity. Same functions. Same 12. I don't know. Just put that down there. So yes, these are technically critical values because it's differentiable. Derivative is zero um, at those numbers, okay? Those real numbered values, radian measure. All right, um, and then, mystery, uh, then what's our, where's our derivative function, right? You say, why? Why do I include zero here? Because cosine, because uh, the derivative is positive at that value. If you don't believe me, check it out. What about, what about zero? Cosine zero. Isn't that one? So if I plug in zero, sine of zero here, there's your first derivative. Cosine's positive at zero because it's one. The derivative is one. Okay. And then you say, what about at two pi? What's happening at the same thing? Cosine two pi is one. Sine 2 pi is 0, so ladies and gentlemen, that is why you have to include the what? That's why this is a square bracket. That's an important detail. That's where students make mistakes. They put random signs there. So increasing. Uh, it's decreasing on that middle interval here, so that's sign analysis. What is important about this point? And important about that point? This is the location of a relative what now? Min. Right? That's the location of a relative, not min. Uh, you, you, you give something that was max. That's relative max, right? And this will be a what? Yeah. Relative min. And they're going to ask you, you say, what is the relative? Minimum value. Well, that's going to be the value of the function at that radian measure. Uh, they did relative min first, so it's going to be 5.829. And the relative max is going to equal f of what? 2.688. And you say, well, what's the function? This is your original function. And we restricted the domain, so anyway. So if you said, I want to know what those values are. OK. Do you guys remember, what, were them as, what did we get as degrees? What were they as degrees, by the way? One what? Is it 154 and 330? 334? I don't remember. Yeah. So since my calculator is already in what mode? Degrees. I can change it to radian. I can still get away with saying what? The function is going to be, what was it? Sine of what? If it's in degrees, I can say sine 154. Close that. Uh, minus 2. Cosine of what? 154. And you get 2.236. And that's the relative min. Relative max will be sine of 334 minus 2 cosine 334. Close that. And I get negative 2.236. Let me be careful here. Uh-oh, let me double check. Is that the right function?
154 degrees, right? I'm going up here. Oh, I, I put it down backwards. That's where my mistake is here. Show point. Here we go. Relative max, 2.6 A to 8. Okay, relative min, 5.8 to 9. There we go. That's where the issue is. Oh, did I screw up it again? Sure. No. Flipped. Yeah. I think I didn't. Okay. 2.688. Ah, something's, something's up. Let's go back to the original worksheet. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me get this. Uh, I don't want to take a picture of that. So let's go back and double check. Yep, that looks good. So the relative max, 2.688. Let me change this. And that happens for 154 degrees. Oh, no, no. Oh. And then, what was that? 5.829 here. And that's for 334 degrees. Okay, so I think I could. There we go. So let's put this in the notes. Now we're good. Let me change colors here. Uh, it doesn't matter. We don't. It's okay. This goes together here. Maybe this goes together there. Okay. Now we have the right. Okay. Change this. Negative, and this will be what? Positive here. Okay. Um, let me also do something just so you guys are completely aware. If I go back to now my website here, so I share with you guys that detail. So if you guys to see my point, you can double check here. That's where you're going to have the relative what again? Relative max? Is that true? That was two point what? If we went to the calculator. 2.236, 154 degrees, and then down here, negative 2.236, that was 334 degrees, but go back to the radian measure. What was the radian measure for 154 degrees? Two six eight eight and five eight two nine. So two six eight eight five eight two nine. Two six eight eight five eight two nine. 
Okay, so I want you guys to see that idea here. So that very much is what consistent with what they're asking, but also notice what is also consistent. I think we should put orange. Then your intervals of increasing from that zero to that number. And then from this number here to six, interval of increasing, and right in the middle of the function is what? Decreasing. So put that guy on the curve, and everything is exactly what we say it is. Is that right? Do you guys see my point? So that's why I even included the what? Graph for you guys. It's a good example. Anyway, should we try this one? Get some more examples of this? All right, what is this one here? Y is x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus 4. So x to the fifth. Let's try that one. x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus 4 now. Let's get in one of these here. We can do the same things again, ladies and gentlemen. Let's find, take the derivative, sign analysis, and it's going to be what? Oh, you guys can't see it. So maybe you guys are good at derivatives by now, hopefully. Isn't that 9x squared? Isn't that the derivative? All right. So I'm going to have to do what with this? Sign what? Sign analysis on that first derivative. So, okay, let's do that there. You're going to set that equal to zero. Is that right? Okay, so that means we get what? 5x to the fourth minus 9x squared equals zero. How do you guys solve this equation? You're going to have to factor out your what? Greatest common factor. Beginning algebra. You get 5x squared minus 9 equals zero. And then what do you guys use? The zero what? product rule. So that means x squared is 0, which means x is 0. 5x squared minus 9 is 0, which will mean 5x squared is 9. x squared would be 9 divided by 5. Square root formula. Simplify your what? All right, simplify that square root, square root of quotient, quotient to square roots, 3 square root of 5, rationalize the denominator, 3 square root of 5 over what? 25. So x will be plus or minus 3 square root of 5 over what? Over, not 25, over 5. Okay, x is 0. Now, are these really critical values, just to kind of bring that up? Are these critical values? Say what? Yes, how do you know they're critical values? This is a polynomial function. What's the deal with polynomial functions? They're continuous everywhere. They're like the, the most beautiful curves you'll see uh, you know, polynomial functions, continuous everywhere, differentiable everywhere. So that means these numbers are in the domain. So that means they're critical values. Okay, good. But you said you, we're doing sign analysis. We are. Oh, we got three values now. Negative 3, square root of 5 over 5, 0, positive 3 square root of 5 over 5. And then those derivatives are what? 
are zero. Okay, now what was that derivative again? I'd say to you guys, use the factored version. The factored version is the easiest version to use. This is that derivative, okay? At least in terms of sign analysis. So use the factored version, and I gotta know something about that number. What is negative three squared of five to the fifth power? Do you guys happen to know numerically what that is? If I said, okay, negative 3 squared of 5, sorry, divided by 5, not to the fifth power, divided by 5. Numerically, that's about a negative 1.34, right? So I'm just going to write that down. That means this is a positive 1.34. Why did I do that? Do you guys know? Because when I get my when I get my what? I'm gonna use two as a test point. I'm gonna use negative one as a test point. Positive one as a test point. Positive two as a what? So my test points are gonna be what you guys see here. Okay, you guys see my point? Why well, I want to use these nice? I got to know those values here. Okay, so we're gonna have to test the regions. So how do you test? Plug in negative or plug in yeah, plug in negative two. Sorry, that's negative two. So if I plug in negative two here, what happens? Right? Isn't that four times five times four minus nine? I don't even care about the answer. I just care about the what? Sign. That means region one is what? Positive. You guys okay with that negative two test point? Okay, let's plug in negative one now. You guys okay with that? So if I plug in negative one, we get one times Five minus nine, I don't care about the answer. I just care that the answer is negative. So region two is negative. Okay. And in fact, ladies and gentlemen, notice this. If I plug in a one even, don't I get the same thing? So region three is what? Negative as well. If I plug in a two back to the two for the test point, I get what I got earlier today with negative 2. Now, that makes a lot of sense. It makes sense because what are you doing with every test point? You're squaring them. So, it'll always, so whether it's positive or negative, you're going to get the same answer. There's some symmetry there. All right, let's do, the, let's do the what? Increasing. What is this? Decreasing. Decreasing. What is this? Increasing. So this is going to be important, ladies and gentlemen. This analysis that we do is going to be extremely important, okay? So I'm going to move this somewhere here. All right, move it there. So let's talk about what this means by that first derivative test, right? What do you guys think? What does it mean, the first derivative test? If I'm standing here, I changed from an increasing to a decreasing situation at my critical value. What does it mean? I'm at a relative what again? Max, outstanding. I'm on top of a hill. What does it mean over here if I change from a, a decreasing 
interval to an increasing interval at a critical value. What does that mean? Relative min. Good. It's at a critical value. Okay. Now, this is what I'm pointing out. Now, what's going on right in here? You go from a negative to a negative. Is that a relative max or a relative min? No, it's not. So you can't say relative max, relative min. You might even say, what does that even mean? Um, I, I'll say this. You're kind of at a cliff. That's my own what? That's my own. We're gonna, I'm going to see what I'm talking about. That's my own language for it. There's nothing in your book to say that you're at a cliff. But I'm going to express it to you guys at the picture so you, so you guys see what I'm talking about. Okay, but if it's also right in here, if you went from um, positive to positive, you're still at a cliff. If you go from negative to you're at a cliff. There's no calculus books that will say cliff. What does that even mean? You know what that means on a curve? You're like something like this. You're standing here. That's negative to negative. That's what I mean by being at a what? Cliff. You're not a, at, a, at a minimum. You're not at a maximum. And the curve could go the other way. You're not at a minimum. You're not at a maximum. So this is like a neither situation. Neither, neither, whatever. I could say you're on a cliff. Because what do I do? I put that person here. You guys know what I mean? That's an extremely important detail. Okay, let's finish this off. You guys ready? What's our conclusion? Your function is increasing on what interval? I think we used orange. So you're going to have to know that as well. Increasing here, where else? Here. Is that right? Okay. So how do we describe this in terms of intervals? Negative infinity up to negative 3, square root of 5 over 5, and that's an open interval. Is that true? Union 3, square root of 5 over 5, up to infinity forever. That's another open what? Interval. So I'm looking at negative infinity up to this value where the derivative equals zero. It's not positive or negative. That's why it's an open interval. Okay. Now you're going to unite that with. Maybe we should put it here on the on the on the graph. Over here. You say, why don't I include it? Because it's zero. Your derivative is zero. It's neutral. It's really a horizontal tangent. And so that's your interval of increasing, okay? It's these two pieces, region one united with region four. Where is it decreasing? Well, we say F is what? Decreasing on, on what? Here to here, and then here to what? Here in green. You say, Mr. Judge, why don't you include zero? Do you guys know why I don't include zero? Because zero is neutral. Zero is not negative. So how do we describe that? Here's how we describe that, okay? We say that's going to be from negative 3 square root of 5 over 5 up to 0, union 0, 3 square root of 5 over 5. And those are open intervals here. This is, we were, this is where we're decreasing here. This is what we're looking at right in here. This is the green portion. You do not include 0. 0 is neutral. 
Okay, zero's not positive, zero's not negative. You can't include it. Okay, relative max, relative min. Okay. I'll start with relative max. That's f of what? Negative 3 square root of 5 over 5. Relative min. F of, where do you have the relative min? Positive 3 over here. Square root of 5 over 5. You're in that valley. Remember that being in a valley? Relative min. Okay. So if you wanted to find those values, you got to go back over here to the function. And you plug it in. Because these, again, are all, what do we say? These altitudes are the corresponding y values. So these are the y values here. And sometimes they'll just say y max, y what, min, just notation-wise. Just so you guys know. Because y is supposed to be what again? f of x. So there's your, your analysis, and you can find that. Okay, you guys can write that stuff down. A picture's worth what? A thousand words, that picture. Mm. Let's see that curve here. See what I'm talking about, right? Somewhere up here. Isn't that the highest altitude? This is that Y max highest altitude. And it happens for this value of X. Let's see what that number was. I think we did. Is it in our calculator still? Yeah, negative, negative uh, 1.34. You guys see that there? So this is negative 1.34. That's your highest altitude. Oops, can't see it. And then you say, where am I at the, the min? Over here, you're at that relative min. This is y min again. And that'll be a positive what? 1.34 on that curve. What was so important about the zero? Remember the zero I talked about? Yeah, I called that a what? You're at a cliff? Meaning you're not at a max, you're not at a min? Okay, reminds me of my backpacking days. And of course, this is where this is the you, we have the interval of what? Aren't you increasing here? Right, we're increasing, and then we're what? Going downhill, going downhill, and then going back uphill. And of course, it's for these values of x that we talked about. You say, Mr. Judge, why did you exclude zero? You're not going downhill. You have a horizontal what? Horizontal tangent. Yeah. Derivative equals zero there. You have a horizontal tangent. Here, by the way, if you want to talk about that, these are your horizontal tangents. Yeah. 
all these open intervals. So that's how you actually uh, use this information, ladies and gentlemen, really partly using this information to sketch a curve. I don't know. What do you guys think? Pictures worth a what? Thousand words. Um, it's in the video. You guys have that in the video. And then, you know what else I did? Like I said, I got a little creative last night. I got home. Darn. Started thinking. What do you know about that? See that curve? It's not defined at zero, is it? So you have a vertical asymptote at zero. What about this? You said, Mr. Judge, what about that curve? We did something like that uh, yesterday, I think, or the other day. I don't remember. What's interesting about zero? You guys remember? It's not differentiable. It's a corner. Is that right? We say it's not smooth. Is it on the function? Is it in the domain? Is zero in the domain? Sure is. So that means it's a critical value. What about this one here? Go back. X equals zero. You might find the derivative there also what? Does not exist at zero because you have a vertical asymptote. So if the derivative does not exist at zero, is it a critical value? No critical value. Why isn't it not a critical value? It's, it's not in the what? It's not in the what? I guess I did a, a dotted line. It's not in the domain of the function. You're not defined at zero. So that definition, that one part, this is again, as, as a calculus instructor, we want to always make sure you understand the difference. When you start taking derivatives and, and doing sign analysis and you want to write down the right things, that the difference between these two is very important. Yes, it's a critical value, even though at zero, the derivative does not exist because it's in the domain of the function, so that makes it a critical value. Here, your derivative does not exist, but x is 0 is not in the domain. Here, x is 0 is in the domain. That's the difference between being a critical value and not what? Critical value. And I did a worksheet, too, with the same curves talking about critical values. And that's for students in the future, or to use that for, for future use. So anyway, I'm just kind of arming myself with additional what whatever curves and you guys see a nice polynomials all oh, those are the best curves ever here's why is sine squared oh zero to two pi we can answer all those questions too you know um i can even see in this question here just see if you guys understand what's happening graphically if you're standing here what does that mean you're at a cliff. <laughs> Good. I'm the only one that says that, by the way. Don't go ask your other math instructors about cliffs. Because I always put that hiking guy. These are nice rolling hills. And I go, oh, he's at a cliff or she's at a cliff. Over here, what's the deal? Relative what? Relative min. You're in a valley. You'll see you go from decreasing to increasing there. You know. Anyway, and I I really got what Ooh, I got that one and oh this is one I like. You know what I like about this one? You know what's interesting at zero? Yeah, what do you have? It's a vertical tangent, is that right? I know it's red on red. It's a vertical tangent, by the way. Y prime does not what? Exist uh, at zero. But is it in the domain? Yes. 
So it makes it that that makes this a critical value. Sorry, I'll put it here. So it goes back and tests you on do you understand these pictures in terms of being differentiable again? And um, oh, you got a what at zero? What do you guys have at zero here? This is uh, f prime what does not exist at x equals zero. Is it a critical value though? How do you know in the domain of the function plug in zero for x? You guys see what I'm saying? So uh, in the future, I'm going to might give this to some classes. You know, anyways, it's another trig example. Um, this is a this is a, a beautiful example because everything works out kind of nice. But then I ended with a, another trig example where you had vertical asymptotes. What do you guys have? And and I changed the interval on this one. It's not from zero to two pi. What is it here? Negative pi to two pi. What do you guys know about that? Pi over two, isn't that 1.5 or something? What do you guys have here? Vertical asymptote. X is, uh, this goes back to those trig students. You guys remember the graph of tangent? Even though it's tangent squared. You say, what's the difference? Well, it, it squares everything. And then that's the curve. So you, you might find that uh, you know, it's not defined there. And it's not differentiable there, right? You say, why not? You have vertical asymptotes. Functions are not differentiable at their vertical asymptotes. So you're going to find that when you go through the process. So I just want to kind of make sure people understand those little details. And I did all those worksheets yesterday thinking about additional examples only because I wanted to go to another book and see what they had. And so I don't, you know, do all the examples or the questions from your book. So I could leave you guys with some nice homework to do. And when do you guys want to get started on your homework? Yesterday. The night before? Yes. <laughs> what happens if you do it the night before? I would say that's not a good use of your time. Why? Could you learn all this stuff the night before? No. So you want to do it when? Yesterday. Good job. Okay, you guys. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Stay safe. Your homework's in Canvas. Have a wonderful day. I hope you guys enjoyed that lecture.